I'm Anita Collins. Hopefully you can see me down the bottom left hand corner. So I'm just going to wave today and just say welcome to everybody that's joined from all across the world. You know, we've got local and international. So that's absolutely fantastic. Yes, I did live in Indonesia, which is why I can speak a little bit. So um, lovely to see you. Thank you very much, Olivia and Jenny, for, for getting arranging this session and getting us started. My name is Anita Collins. I'm the Programme Manager for the Learning and Teaching Programme. So I'm just going to be taking the next half hour or so, 30 minutes, just to kind of run through a bit of a taster. Um, it, we're looking at children's learning at home today, um, as we thought that was very much a theme that's kind of of our time. Um, and just to kind of give you a chance to have a little go and, and experience what it's like um, being in our sessions, because they are quite interactive. At the moment, they are also online, so this is reflecting the kind of things that we've been doing in our sessions over the last couple of weeks. Um, and we are going to uh, yeah, be, be just uh, getting you getting you a flavour of of what we do on the on the, the program and the fact that it's very much an applied program, so you can kind of get a sense of how that what that feels like in practice. So th those are my details. Please, um, you know, do ask questions. On the chat function as you're going through and I'll try and answer them uh, as best I can um, but also you've got my contact details here you've got my email at the bottom um, and here so you know do please feel free to email me with any queries that you've got or any questions that you've got very happy to answer that and uh, and we'll follow that through uh, after the session because I know we've got limited time today um, so today what we're going to be looking at is uh, uh, we're going to be looking at um, children's learning at home. We're going to look at this in two ways. We're going to think about um, formal, informal learning in, the, in a home environment rather than a school environment. And that's something, that, you know, we, we look at on our program anyway, but obviously it's particularly pertinent at the moment. We'll look at ways to create a conducive learning environment. Um, that's the first part of the session. And then the second part of the session, we'll look at how you can encourage engagement in learning in the home uh, or in informal settings. Just a, a few hints and tips, really. Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing in this next half hour. Um, um, so do use the chat function as we go through if you've got any questions um, and I will deal with those. So the first part here is thinking about how to create a conducive learning environment, how to create an environment for learning. And obviously, you know, if children go to school, that's an environment that's been set up and has been thought about very carefully in terms of learning. But there's aspects of the learning of, uh, of the home and space around the home, which we can think about in relation to making a conducive learning environment. A, a learning environment conducive means, you know, a, a, an environment which is um, easy for learning or creates a positive environment for learning. So that's the word conducive. Um, it's a bit of an unusual word, maybe. Yeah, it's easy for learning. Um, so three aspects of this. We're going to think out inside and outside the home. The emotional space, how do we create an emotional space for learning and, and enable readiness for learning? And then how do we create a cognitive space in terms of being ready to engage and being able to process? Cognitive is talking about how we process this mentally. So really it's the physical, the emotional and the mental space. How do we create that? How do we create an environment that will be best for learning um, in a home environment or an informal environment? So the first one we're going to think about is a physical space inside and outside. So what we're going to do together, and we're going to be uh, looking at thinking about this, and I'm going to ask you to write on the next slide, is what spaces are available in your home environment for learning? And how can these best be utilised? So how can we use these environments for learning? And then thinking about outside, you know, it could be that you've got some outside space next to your home as part of your home, a garden, for example, or it may be that you've got spaces outside your home like a park, but it could also be the streets, the shops, the houses um, that you've got uh, around. Because I think, you know, in a school environment, we have, there are lots of spaces, you know, children are moving around or young people are moving around from different spaces Places, different rooms for different subjects going inside and outside um, and then um, so thinking about that you we can create something similar to that within a home environment by moving to different rooms for example you know we've got the kitchen we've got the the bathroom you know you can move into different spaces to do different things to use different resources obviously outside uh, maybe for physical space um, and 
thinking about the the local environment you know for example the shops you know just going shopping can be a learning experience maybe looking at what kind of shops there are and and, and thinking about the different uses of shops that's geography if you go out into the road and count the cars and then do a tally of that that's math isn't it and statistics so there's different ways that we can use the environment and of course if you've got a park you can do all kinds of natural environmental kinds of uh, activities or art um, so I think it's just like let's try and you know I want you to think creatively thinking about what what spaces have you got within, within a home environment and how could you use these differently for learning opportunities and also around you know within walking distance we're not talking about getting in a car so within walking distance you know what have you got available and how might you be able to use that for different aspects of of living with children or young people so thinking about a day or a week as moving in and out of different physical spaces so what I'm going to invite you to do now is thinking about is think about this and to write. We're going to have our first practice of writing on this whiteboard here in this space here. As uh, Jenny uh, explained to you earlier, if you click on the text icon here, that's the best one to do. And if you do that, you can then start to write. So, for example, I can say uh, park. Okay, so I can write on there. If you want to, for example, if somebody's put an idea up that you like and you would, you know, would choose as well, if you click on the pencil, you can then tick. But it's quite hard to write with the pencil, so I would really encourage you to write using this text icon. Don't use the clear button because that will clear everything off this page and we don't want that. So I'm going to give you a couple of um, a couple of uh, minutes now just to, oh, somebody's already come in, so get in there. Um, don't worry if you're writing over other people, we can move stuff around, but click click your, your mouse onto the, the, the whiteboard space, brilliant, okay, so think about what are the different spaces, how can you utilise them, so think about both of those things, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes just to write up anything you want to, any questions put in the chat. That's looking absolutely brilliant. Oh, somebody's very lucky they've got an allotment. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> Lovely. I'll just move this around. Oh, there I can. Lovely. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not having much luck in moving people's uh, things around. Don't worry, we'll sort that out later. That's you, Elizabeth. You are very then. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. OK, so we've had a used kitchen to do fractions using fruits. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. So maybe let's think about that then. Um, thinking about so we've got lots of different we've got lots of great ideas about where you might be. So what I'd like you to what I'd like to invite you to say now is what you might do in those areas. Lovely. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you're in the garden. So what kind of things, what kind of learning uh, opportunities are there then, do you think, in, in the garden, on the balcony? Somebody's always already suggested about, you know, the kitchen and doing fractions. Oh, frogs and tattles, lovely. <laughs> so there's lots of opportunity, isn't there, for learning through, like, look at the world and exploring it. And actually, if you think about it, obviously, Many people choose to homeschool their children anyway, or other people's children. Um, and so, you know, this is really thinking about, you know, we're trying to get into the mindset of a, of a homeschooler here and looking at all the, all the opportunities that we have. And actually, there's lots of things they can't do in a school um, environment, yeah, that, uh, that we can do, like just head out and go to the park if we've got one nearby or, or you know, that freedom to, to roam around locally. Um, that's something that we've really to do yes adding price to what they buy lovely so things in the shops thinking about how we're engaging in everyday activities aren't we so it's a really great opportunity for developing social skills and sort of practical everyday um skills as well yeah absolutely brilliant um and i think you know we're thinking about learning aren't we in a, in a broad way not just about sats so in a sense you know we've escaped from sats in a, uh, a little bit because we've uh, you know the kids are not in school at the moment so yeah 
that's lovely shopping list for picnics and budgets lovely seeds yes we've been doing that as well here in my house yeah thank you everybody yes um nadine's just said everyone's doing really well with the online space and i'm also really impressed with how well you're interacting love art in the garden yeah i was thinking about um you know the opportunity for doing like andy goldsworthy type you know art with leaves and things like that um art on the floor in the garden shamina i don't know if you're talking about uh, and gardens yeah so shamina what are you doing in art on the floor in the garden you can type it in the chat if you like shall color transport bingo okay we've got absolutely loads of brilliant ideas here this is absolutely fab well done guys yeah brilliant ideas right i'm gonna to have to stop you because we're going to run out of space but what i'm going to do now is i'm going to um i'm going to print the screen and i shall save that onto another sheet so that we've got that um so that we don't lose it <laughs> um that's absolutely brilliant yeah thank you very much everybody we're going to move on now um so we're going to think about emotionals now so thinking about readiness for learning so this is, you know, obviously less tangible. You know, we started with something that's quite easy to get hold of by a mean tangible, you know, can get hold of it. So how we can we create readiness for learning? So if we don't feel safe and happy, it's difficult to learn. If we don't feel in a, in that, that's a mental space as well. And we'll think about that in a minute as well. So how do we create a safe space for learning? You know, obviously encouraging, showing kindness and patience. And we know how challenging that can be when we're all stuck together in lockdown. Um, but those are really key things to, to kind of really try to keep the positivity. I think developing positive relationships, that's something obviously we talk about a lot in education. And, and that's, the, you know, the, the, obviously the case at home as it is everywhere else. Um, thinking, taking a genuine interest in what the child is doing or the young person is doing, showing care and concern for them. Setting expectations and ground rules, you know, you can do that with children, you know, uh, young children as well as obviously with teenagers, that's really important that they're feeling respected and, and uh, engaged. Um, thinking about routines, but also variety. And the balance of that would depend on the child. You know, you might have a child and you might have a child with a SEN, for example, with autism who needs something very clearly, a really clear, clear routine established. But on the other hand, you might, you might have children who actually need to have a lot of change and variety. So this is a real advantage of being in the home is that you've got that, you know, one to one or maybe just a small number of children you're working with. So you have got that opportunity to do that. Thinking about transitions into and out of activities, you know, saying what you're going to do and when just so that the children or the young people are, you know, ready, ready for learning and knowing when they're going to move into that. Um, so those are just a few ideas. So again, thinking about that, sorry, I'll go back to that slide for a minute. So you've got a minute more to have a think about it. So again, thinking about those aspects and anything else that you can think of in terms of how do you think you could or how do you think you are doing or have worked with children um, to help them to be in, a, in the space and an emotional space to be ready for learning, to feel happy and, and, and comfortable. So it's the same thing again on this side. So if you use the T, the text, uh, to write anything that you've got in here. Lovely, and we've got lots of great suggestions as well in the uh, in the uh, in the chat. Thank you very much. Someone's put calming music here. Yeah. <laughs> we could all do with some of that, couldn't we? At the moment, oh, that sounds great. Ah, and now a next board. Okay. Ah, so that's Helen. Is that that's for the managing transitions? I think. Yeah, that's a really great idea. Thank you coming up with so much, so many fantastic things oh thank you <laughs> yeah so letting the children decide how to set up having some routines good expectations lovely yeah yeah clear and small instructions lovely oh a blanket close by that's lovely <laughs> i really like that People are coming up with loads of stuff in the chat as well about uh, loads of really act great activities that you've been seeing people doing within your environment. So I guess we're all learning from each other at the moment, aren't we, in this? So, uh, yeah, that's, that's a bit fab. Thank you.
let children take lead lovely so oh draw me a picture <laughs> that's lovely fun atmosphere yeah fun lots of feelings about fun so it's, it's a bit different different emotional spaces isn't it sometimes you need calm sometimes you're needing fun uh, maybe the the music as well you know you might have different music for different kinds of activities as well to move from one thing to another um, it's okay to get stuff wrong thank you yeah that's a really important thing and that's for us as well isn't it that I think that's a good reminder that we need an emotional space for learning as well if we're working alongside children and young people that's absolutely fab thank you okay great taking regular breaks lovely okay I'm going to move us on that we've got absolutely loads of fantastic stuff there again I shall take a a uh, into that and we'll move on to the next Okay, so the last one that we're going to look at in this first is cognitive space. So we're thinking about focus and attention. And obviously, this relates to the last two points, really. You know, it's it's not a separate thing. But thinking about how do we how do we engage and main focus? Um, you know, it will vary for different children, different times of the day and different times of the week. And you know, people have talked about learners with special educational needs and disabilities, and and that we you know will be very specific. I put a rule of thumb. There's some research that says you know 20 minutes is probably about a, a kind of typical um, amount of time that we can concentrate for. But obviously, there's a huge amount of individual variation with that. Breaks and changes topic and focus. It depends on what you're doing. Also, thinking about the speed, the pace that relates to the last point when we were talking about you know. If we wanted to have something calming and reflective or we want something that's more energetic and energized you know that will really depend partly on the activity partly on the child but these are just all like different factors really to think about so think about in terms of the cognitive space the noise level so that can be really varied you know some children may need quiet to focus others may need noise in order to focus a child with uh, ADHD um, which is a attention deficit hyperactivity disorder they may need to have something else going on like listening to music and headphones in order to focus um, so it's really finding out what works best for your child or different children that you're working with um, physical distractions again for a child with autism with autistic um, uh, spectrum condition they may find having lots of things around them very distracting like on the wall whereas for other children it might be a, a helpful kind of visual stimulus so it does depend on the child and thinking about you know for particularly for younger children you know having some structured and some unstructured play and activities to allow them some sort of headspace and ways to work more creatively and independently as well as maybe some, some spaces where the play is more structured and they're being kind of guided towards particular aspects. And then really this last question is just about, you know, how can we create a sense of wonder and curiosity? Because that's partly what, what this is, is kind of engaging cognitively. And obviously that's also got an emotional aspect to it. You know, if we ask questions like what happens next or why or what if, what would happen if, you know, these kind of questions with children open their minds up engage them intellectually in in terms of their their mental space but also you know that in, includes obviously engages the emotional as well which is an, an important aspect so you know how to do this now guys get in there so how can you facilitate how can you help to have space you know to, to enable that 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 focus that attention and that processing in children you know what what are the things that you think you can do you know maybe relating to those points we just looked at um, or what you you might you might do or have done or have seen done so just a minute to uh, to put up any ideas on here again using the text yeah that's really important so time for the children to talk good yeah and it could be things like focus questions as well, a plan. Yeah, having a plan is always good. <laughs> yeah, lovely. So what you're doing with these, if you're talking about asking children for your uh, ideas, giving the time for children to talk, asking children what they prefer, these are lovely. These are what we'd call cognitive, you know, from a cognitive theory point of view, the, what, that's what you're doing. You're stimulating and engaging their mind thinking and that's what that it is and that's what we look at on the course you know what we're doing today we're looking at some of the things we look at in our learning theories module in the first year and also some of the things that we're looking at in our developing teaching skills module in the second year so you're already coming up with the kind of ideas and, and uh, points that we we discuss and we look at 
that's brilliant yeah relate things to things the child enjoys lovely to their interest that's absolutely brilliant yeah so that's about engagement and motivation but it's also about in a cognitive sense and thinking about their mental processing their structure is is you relating to the the new to the to the known and that's a really key aspect that's a really key part of what we call cognitive theory of learning you know when we're relating the new to the already known and and these these points that you're raising here are are key in relation to that that's absolutely brilliant be calm lovely yes and that relates to kind of emotional as well as cognitive but yes absolutely if we're not in the right emotional space then we, our cognitive faculties are not there either. So we need both of those things. Children as teachers, someone's put, I love that. Yes, we'll look at that in a minute actually, but yeah, the best way to learn is to teach. So yeah, great. And activities suited to their age, absolutely. And that is key in terms of um, thinking about um, what you do and also how you do it being suited to their age. And that, that's, that's tricky. I mean, obviously teachers spend a lot of time training for that and then a lot of it get, gain a lot of experience in that. So I think the thing that somebody said on the last slide about um, how children, you know, how children are, um, um, what do you, oh, I lost my thread completely there. Um, so yeah, th thinking about uh, children, teaching and uh, somebody yeah uh, somebody said something earlier oh, I've completely lost my bed there sorry right so that's brilliant so that's lots of ideas and I think the next I'm going to go through a few little smart uh, a few more slides now really which draw on this aspect of uh, the cognitive space um, and really think about some of the techniques that you're starting to to come up with here about how we might engage children and um, because I'm aware we've only got about five minutes so key things really here are experiment explore find out what works sorry I'm going to go back to that one I know um, find out what works for, and doesn't work for each child um, so you know you've got that opportunity if you're working at, her, at home if you're at home and you're learning with that child to do that to personalize and that's what we have to do as practitioners all the time um, okay so encouraging engagement with learning so really what I'm going to do here is just go through a few ideas and these are not set in stone at all but these are just a few things I really pulled out of the hat um, in terms of thinking about what might be helpful things to do or helpful things to think about but I very much want you to think about it with the with the with the thought in mind that this is a a child or children that you know that you're working with and it needs to work for them so you know don't want you to use something if it doesn't work if you tried it a few times and it's not working then adapt it do it differently so we talked about this earlier you came up with this having having targets for learning small steps clear outcomes that's just really helpful for kind of motivation and we're talking about intrinsic so intrinsic motivation is the kind of the, the motivation that you might naturally have for something if you really enjoy a subject and extrinsic motivation is motivation that comes from outside so like something because you're going to get a reward that's extrinsic motivation so we can help with both of these things um, so check in on these regularly so if you think about targets if you're setting targets we talked about this earlier in the session check in on them you know encourage redirect explain you're kind of helping to keep focus and that's both an emotional and motivational and climate for learning thing it's all of those things learning together and alongside showing enthusiasm modeling enthusiasm and interest for learning taking stock so you know taking time to look at what the child has done um, thinking about you know you may want to reward it appropriately you know and that's where extrinsic comes in you might need to give them a little bit of extra encouragement to do something that they find difficult or challenging or is not their favorite subject or something that they find a bit harder to do so then a reward can really help to pull through with motivation and a key thing I think with motivation is no one to stop or let go you know the journey and particularly in these kind of circumstances and when we're learning at home we're learning in a more informal environment you know it's not about just kind of keeping going no matter what if the child is not engaging if they're not learning then however much you are trying to engage with them like we say you can teach but they won't learn so you know if you see it as a long term it's a marathon it's not a, pre, a, a not a sprint you know we're in it for the long term particularly if we're working with children in a more informal environment you know so learning when to stop is really important so that's hopefully when you feel like what you feel like when your motivation is good you've got there and you've you've achieved this um so 
got a few more minutes. So next thing I really wanted to look at is positive and constructive communication. So again, this relates to a really good point somebody was saying earlier about age, something being age appropriate, you know, that cognitively it needs to be at the uh, the level of the child. It needs to be something that they can understand, that they're ready to understand with the right language. So you need to think about that. So give clear and straightforward instructions. That's important for everybody. Give explanations clearly, as clearly as you can, simply as you can, using eye contact if that's appropriate. With some children who maybe have autistic spectrum condition, they might not want to make eye contact, um, but most of the time eye contact is helpful. Thinking about the level and the type of language you're using, is that right for the child's age and stage? And there's a few terms today that I've explained to you because maybe they're more technical and they're things to, you know, that I wouldn't expect you to know. So it's OK to use, you know, to stretch your child or the, that young person to use language um, that they're not familiar with. That's good. That's part of development. But it's being conscious of when you're doing that, when you're pushing them forward and making sure that you're giving them support with that. Checking understanding as you go through. Somebody was talking about that earlier. One of your comments, um, you know, do that by observing them asking questions you might do an example together until they're ready to go it alone it's a bit like you know if a child is learning to ride the bike you might hold them along uh, you might hold them until they're ready to pedal without you and then you can let go that that's kind of that process really and encouraging to ask questions and i think again in the previous activity a lot of you were coming up with you know ask questions to uh, to the child so ask questions to check understanding that's really important you know checking they understand what they're doing or if they get stuck to help them so again these are just a few hints and tips really and it's just things to try out um, and you know it will involve lots of practice and trial and error on your part if you're not if you've not been engaging in in uh, in this before you know so just be really kind to yourself and patient with yourself that was the point that I lost earlier that we for ourselves you know um, when we're working with children we need to recognize that we are also learning and that we may have yeah self-compassion they do put yeah absolutely and that's important for our own well-being but also for us to be you know effective educators you know we need to make sure that we recognize that we are learning as well so the last quick thing really was just, and then we'll, we'll have a couple of minutes just to reflect on this. If you're learning with more than one child, encourage them to learn alongside each other, obviously with you. This models learning as an activity you will engage with. And, you know, you can get interaction with each other, questioning, demonstrating, explaining and teaching. Somebody put on one of the earlier slides that child could teach. And actually peer teaching has been found by a study by, by Hattie in New Zealand to be the most effective learning method. Um, we learn best by teaching others. There's also a, a pyramid which has that at the top. So, you know, peer teaching is very effective. Um, so, you know, it's not just about giving them the chance to, to be um, uh, to have more control over their learning, but but cognitively in terms of learning, it's, it's very effective. So just a couple of minutes now to think about um, these things we have literally got two minutes before we're going to stop this part and move on to the next part of the session so thinking about this these things that we've talked about maybe particularly the last three parts that we've looked at in relation to um, how we can learn effectively um, which points do you think you can apply easily so I'm just going to give you a minute to put any uh, thoughts on there so what about the we've looked at so but be kind to yourself good I'm glad you can do that easily and that's a really really important thing so I think if you if you take that away I'll be very happy and I know Nadine will be all right as well asking questions to check learning lovely because questions are things that, that you know they have multiple purposes so you can ask questions to to find out what they know um, to reinforce um, to make sure they've understood Thing, you know and it could be understanding a concept or understanding what they're doing so questioning is like a, you know it's a very multi-faceted uh, skill learning together as a family absolutely yeah so I think it is just thinking that you know you can't do I mean there are obviously there are village schools across the country that always do um, multi-age learning you know um, and so this is something that that does happen all the time personalized learning to the child yeah brilliant um, yeah different places to learn good yeah yeah good 
and thinking about making readiness to learn so it might be that actually you're thinking of is your your job is as much getting them ready to learn you know they, they might be off once they get on so you might find that once they're doing the task you really have very little to do but actually it's getting them into that space and creating that kind of, that environment that conducive that positive environment for learning yeah age appropriate activities timekeeping oh yeah that's a good one <laughs> or is somebody just giving a hint that we're nearly out of time making it fun lovely yeah and I think again making it fun that's what we've you know the advantage that we've got when we're working when we're we're learning at home and in a more informal environment is that fun aspect can really come to the fore yeah and if you think about you know if we are learning in lockdown this is a short period of time so let's make the most of it short tasks brilliant good right we're going to have 30 seconds any points which are problematic or impossible? So anything that you think is going to be impossible or problematic from what we've talked about today or difficult. Problematic is what I mean by difficult. <laughs> Nadine saying we always also make it believe in making learning fun for our adult learners. I'm learning a lot about what I should be doing as a parent homeschooling, says Olivia. Yeah. Right. Yeah, keeping motivation yourself. Yes, of course. So again, I think it's really important. Yeah, and child not engaging. And it's very, it's very frustrating and difficult. I know that I've got a seventeen-year-old, um, and yeah, it's it's really tough, isn't it? So I think with this, those both of those points, I think really is what I've I have had that in mind when I was planning this session, knowing how hard both of those things are, and maybe also that. You know if you're anything like like those of us that are here we may have children but we're also trying to work alongside this so you know it's not like we have um that that much time to engage either so yeah thank you well i'm glad it's only two things that you've come up with three are uh, putting everything to a side yeah for example work just giving children that time absolutely yeah absolutely i think the, the point about the home being different from from school so i think there's ways in which but hopefully we've come up with a few ideas today um about how we can maybe make it a bit different but but yeah that is that is a real real problem isn't it that um in a sense we're not then how do we make sure that that home is also a space to relax not to you know be engaged in things yeah lovely okay i'm done now um, thank you very much, everybody. For I just realised that as, lo as long as, as uh, alongside screenshots, we've obviously also got the recording of this, so we should be able to. Uh, you can look at this and, and get all of these points. So thank you so much, everybody, um, for all your amazing contributions, um, and yeah, I hope you've enjoyed that. And it has given you a bit of a taste of, of what we we do. This is how we work, and usually we actually physically talk to each other. <laughs> um, and we get to know each other but it's been lovely and uh you know i'm really impressed with all of your contributions so uh so well done <laughs> thank you okay um shall i let you take over now then learning champion thanks very much anita that was fantastic and thanks to everyone for participating so much it's always a much more effective and enjoyable session if we can really hear from the participants in some ways so i'm really impressed with how quickly everyone got to grips with the whiteboard and uh, interacted with us. So as I said at the beginning we're lucky enough now to have a couple of our students with us today and they're going to share a little bit about their experience. We have Gail and Helen um, and I think I'll start by introducing Gail if that's okay. Over to you Gail. Okay thank you yeah so my name's Gail um, I've just finished my third year in learning and teaching foundation degree in SEND um, I've worked in a special school for 12 years now um, and started working there as a, a lunchtime supervisor. Um, just sort of fell into the, rule, uh, into the role through sort of necessity really because that fit in uh, with my kids in dropping off and picking up at school. I'd never worked in a school before uh, and fully intended to go back um, to my job as a, a secretary. Uh, but my son being diagnosed at two with autism uh, sort of change, change my route. Um, so I ended up um, going to work as a, a lunchtime supervisor um, and then sort of worked as a teaching assistant and through the years ended up working as a HTA uh, and it was at that point three years ago um, that I started my foundation degree. Never ever thought I'd get a degree 
Um, I left school straight after GCSEs. Um, I had no qualifications other than that. Um, I'd worked up um, into my role in school through experience. I'd not been to college. I'd not got any NVQs um, and sort of pretty much went into my university interview with uh, a handful of GCSEs. Um, and thankfully, they accepted me on the course um, and I've absolutely loved it. I met some great people, um, our classes friends. Um, they're not just uh, university peers anymore. They're really, really good people and we've got some good friends. Um, the, fan, the, the support that you get through the, the Lifelong Learning Centre is fantastic. They can't do enough for you. Any problems whatsoever, they're on the end of a phone or an email and anything that goes wrong, any problems that you've got, any worries, then they'll sort it out immediately. Uh, we've been doing online learning for the last sort of few weeks, uh, which has been different for us all. And I'd never done this before. Um, and I suppose like when you when you started off doing this, it started to feel really awkward and embarrassing. But over the uh, over this sort of hours of the, the first lesson, we all got into it. We were all chatting. Um, it's really, really supportive environment. Um, we've all got WhatsApp, so all our course um, are all what got on a WhatsApp group together. Uh, we all help out each other. Um, there's lots of learning spaces where you can post questions and support each other, uh, which uh, Nadine and Anita um, sort of set up for us. But yeah, you're here listening to this and you're obviously interested in doing it. And all I can say is give it a go. It is definitely, definitely manageable. And my life's really busy. Um, I work as a HLTA and sometimes as a, an unqualified teacher, depending on what's going on in school. So I've got lots of stuff to do at home. Um, got lots of stuff um, to do with with home as well, with with my kids and supporting my kids. And it, it really is manageable. So you're here wanting to do it. And all I can say is give it a go because you really do it. That's fantastic, Gail. Thanks so much. It's really useful to hear um, that, you know, students with substantial commitments, family and work commitments can manage some part time study on top of that. And I hope that um, the course is facilitated in such a way and the support is there to make that easier. So I, I hope that's been really useful for everyone. Gail and Helen are going to stay around for the rest of the session. So if you have any questions for either of them, please do put them in the chat. And now, Helen, I'd like to introduce you. If you can tell us a little bit about your experience, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Helen and I am also coming to the end of my third year foundation degree in teaching and learning. I've just got a couple of pieces of work to wrap up. Um, but due to the COVID, I have been ill and I have to say that uh, the support I've received from the university and the staff in the LLC in regards to handing in work has been absolutely brilliant. They want me to succeed and they'll uh, absolutely support you in that. Um, I left school similarly to Gail. Um, I didn't have any O-levels and I did go on to college. Um, got my my qualification did what I needed it to do and at the age of um, <coughs> 46 um, found that I was in a position that I actually needed to go back to college and get my English and Math O level. Um, that's where I ran into um, Olivia and Fiona who went some way to changing uh, changing my life because every single question or statement I said about not going to university, um, they managed to give me the answer, actually, yes, you can. I'm too old. No, you're not. Um, I don't have the money. We can help you if, you, you know, we can help you with the finances. We can send you down the right road. Um, well, I don't know what I want to do. Well, come and speak to the guidance counsellor. So um, having left school at 16, being told that you'll never go to university, here I am about to um, finish my foundation degree and start. My top up um, in September, fingers crossed. It's the best thing I've done. I love it. Um, I've met some fantastic 
uh, people, like Gail says, uh, customers, friends, and I'm doing it for me. Um, and I think that's really something that is a positive. Um, I want to do it, so I'm going to make time. Yeah, I have to do some juggling. I work full time in the school. I'm a one to one uh, in a mainstream primary school, um, but it's manageable. And like I said earlier, the support I've received from the staff at the LLC is is phenomenal. Um, so. Yes, yes, Gail, I am a very mature student. <laughs> it's never too late. And as Nike says, just do it. Worst thing that comes out is that you come out of uh, speaking to a guidance counsellor and actually, no, it's not something you want to do. But it is a very different experience to school. Um, and I can't say anything more than that. Just give it a go, please. Brilliant, Helen. Thank you so much. It's really useful to hear your experience as well. And I hope you are feeling better now. You've been through a lot. Um, but it's really good to know that it's possible for people to fit study around full time working and, and those massive commitments that you have in your lives. Um, just to, briefly to say, because I want you to get some information about the course from Anita, the financial situation for adults going to university or for anyone going to university, although there's a lot of information in the media about debt and fees and it does put people off um, from even considering it. The fees are not up front so you don't need to pay for your tuition fees. As long as you're eligible you'll get a, a loan from the government to pay all your fees. Eligibility we can check out with you but it's generally around not already having a UK degree or equivalent and about your residency status but we can help you work out most people are eligible and um, you only begin to repay those fees once you're earning above £26,000 if you never earn that you don't repay and there is additional support available um, which is non-repayable if you have a disability or if you have dependents children or anyone you're caring for um, and after 30 years all your remaining debt is wiped so the debt is not passed on to family or anyone else so nobody else can be negatively affected by you going to university so just to put that in a little bit of perspective before we hand back to Anita to tell us a little bit more about the program thanks Anita hi everyone thank you very much and thank you thank you um, for that and thank you of course to uh, to Gail and Helen for absolutely fantastic uh, advocacy for the course and uh, and it always makes me very proud and and also to see how you know the skills um, and confidence of, of our students uh, to to talk more eloquently than I'm doing now <laughs> in such situations. So thank you very much, and that's brilliant. It's a real, it's a real. Uh, um, it really shows what what happens on the course and and how how our students move on and develop. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about. I shall whiz through this. Um, as I said at the beginning, do. Um, contact me as a follow-up so you can contact me directly or you can contact any of the outreach team the community partnerships team and they'll pass your query on to you and you know I'll email you or I can ring you up for a chat so don't don't hesitate to do that as a follow-up I'm very happy to explain more and to go through your individual circumstances but I'm just going to run through quickly a bit of an overview of the course um, so the foundation degree in learning and teaching we have two pathways one is ascend uh, and one is not send, although actually we have lots of send all the way through our program. I realise that there may be a few people here that have maybe got a cert ed or maybe already have a degree. So you might be wanting to come on to the BA top up. Uh, I'm not explicitly focusing on that today, but but actually most of the things, some of the information on here, most of the information on here will be relevant to that. So I will just as an aside mention that as well, but, but follow that up with me. Um, obviously, you might be wanting to do the BA top up if you've already got a degree or a, a cert ed. Um, so why study in the foundation degree? It's designed for people supporting learning or working with learners in different educational settings. That doesn't have to be a school. You could be working in a charity. You could be doing just a little bit of training on your job. You could be working in support roles in various contexts. So it's not about being in a school or already 
teaching or even supporting or it could be that you wish to do that that this is something that you want to do and this degree would be part of that we're very much relating everything to professional practice so we look at theory and we relate it to practice we look at practice related to theory just like we've done today and we've got the uh, special educational needs and disabilities um, for both the foundation degree and the BA top up there's only a little difference between the two um, are we all right and we've only got a little difference between the two um, and basic but the, basically the key thing is that you would have send in the title of your degree so it's whether that's really important for you I'll explain differences as we go through the way that it's structured in terms of practicalities you would come in and study one afternoon a week for four hours we also have five till six p.m. now a group tutorial which we really encourage you to join in the first year of the foundation degree it's uh, Tuesdays and uh, in the second and third degree of uh, year years of the foundation degree you come in on Wednesday afternoon and when you go into the BA top up you have automatic right to progress to that you don't have to formally reapply um, or you just fill in an application form but you you have an automatic right to go on to that um, though that's on a Thursday afternoon but it may be that you're wanting to go straight onto the BA um, if you've already got a cert ed or a degree um, in which case you can talk to me about it and you'd be attending on Thursdays um, we have two semesters at Leeds Un University and they're 10 weeks per semester so you're you're coming in for 20 weeks a year. Um, term time follows the schools we have a reading week for half term because we're aware of the fact that many if not all of our students are you know working in schools and may have children and need to be off for um, half term um, the foundation degree is three years part-time um, the BA top-up is a year uh, or eight, two years or 18 months um, like I said you've got automatic rights to progress for that and there's a link on the bottom there for you to go in and have a look at the course on our program catalogue um, so those are the key things really um, so you have quite long holidays <laughs> entry requirements somebody was asking about that earlier I think it was Elizabeth um, you need to have a GCSE maths or and English grade C or level 4 or above or something equivalent if you don't have those we do have an alternative entry scheme um, it's called matriculation uh, and that's a test for maths and for English that you can take and we also provide support with preparing for that test so if you don't have your master English it doesn't mean that you can't consider coming on the course or we can't consider you so do still chat to me or apply and we'll look at that you also need to have a level three diploma in a relevant subject area like it may be the cash diploma in sport and teach learning um, or it might be something in childcare. Um, we also take three A level passes, but we also again have an alternative entry scheme, which is a, an, an assignment that you do for us, um, which shows your skills at that level. So again, if you don't have these still kind of if you're interested, do still come and talk to us and we can have a look at that. Elizabeth asked about um, work being working within education. You need to be engaged in relevant work experience, but this could be voluntary and it's a minimum of 60 hours a year. So, for example, if you wanted to start supporting in schools and you could find a voluntary position for, say, a couple of hours a week, that would be enough for our requirements to be on the course. But you need this because the course is applied and we're always talking about how would this work in practice. These are the core modules in year one of the foundation degree and you just do core modules. So you do a bit of, of study skills, you do a bit on learning theory. We've done we've got a send module and child development module. In the second year, you go on to developing teaching skills. That's a core module looking at the policy. And if you're doing the send route, you do a work based learning placement in your second uh, second semester of your second year. That doesn't mean that you have to have a, a you do that placement within the course time on a Wednesday afternoon. In the third year, there are two core modules, one on curriculum and assessment and one on creating learning resources. Um, you also do optional modules, and these are some examples of them, uh, coaching and mentoring using stories, application of counselling skills and dyslexia. So you can see that, you know, dyslexia is an uh, option there and it is uh, <laughs> and it relates to our SEND um, programme. Uh, this is really again saying that it's a praxis based program so that means that we're relating theory to practice and we're reflecting on practice in relation to theory and developing theory based on that we also have research modules which Nadine runs and um, 
we think you know we start to develop your skills as a practitioner researcher so that you can look into things that are going on in the classroom and or in your education environment and and explore those and and develop your own practice from that what can it lead to career options promotions and new roles you could become a higher level teaching assistant a special educational needs coordinator you might become a cover supervisor or a training officer people go into leadership positions they go on to do pgces bas and deliver learning and maybe even ma's and phds we've got students doing ma's this year um, and, and lots of students going on to do PA, pgces after the ba top up and this is the teaching team and I'm just going to pass over to Nadine for a minute here just to, to add something. So I'm the programme manager, Nadine is the deputy programme manager. We have two um, key part-time tutors and there is a number of other staff in the centre who also contribute individual modules. Sorry, over to you Nadine. Hi, hello. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, just checking. Um, hi, so um, I'd just like to add that I've been a mature student for 13 years. Finally, not a mature student. Um, and I'm also from a working class background and I'm the first in my family to go to uni. Um, I just wanted to briefly say um, that we're very mindful that when um, our students come to our sessions that there's things going on at home, um, in, whether it's directly with them or um, with people around them. So we all sort of check in. So it's just again, you know, as we do with them, we're doing with you now. So if there's anything that's sort of triggered anything about what we're talking about. So for example, some people's homes aren't always a, a safe space. Um, please let anybody who was involved in the session today know, and we can signpost you on to um, relevant support in the local area. Um, so, for example, domestic violence or mental health or anything like that, you know, we are really here to support you in numerous ways beyond, you know, the cognitive and it's very much like we were talking about with the emotional aspect before and the social dimensions. Okay, but it's been great. It's been just fantastic to see you all engaging so much and I feel really honoured to have been here today with you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine. So it was lovely for you to also see Nadine. I think she looks like Rosie the Riveter in those headscarves. I love them. So uh, <laughs> that's great. This last slide is just really um, for you to, to kind of go and have a look at. We've got a fantastic video of one of our current students who works as an autism lead in a primary school and her day and her graduation. And it's such a joyful, um, if anything's going to inspire you, uh, hopefully, as well as our learning champions, that will. Uh, it's one of our one of our students, uh, Vicky Gorthop. So uh, do have a look at that link, really. Um, so uh, any questions? We've got about five minutes left for that. And I know Olivia's got something just to wrap up. Um, that, has anybody got any questions? <laughs> if so, please put in the chat or you can write on here as well, actually using the text function. Anything uh, you still want to learn? No. Anything? If anyone wants to raise their hands, we can unmute yeah. you and you can ask a question Absolutely. verbally. That would be lovely. <laughs> Shall I tell us a little bit about the guidance service and then if people have questions while I'm talking, yeah. uh, we can That's we can fine. answer those. So yeah. just to say that if you're considering study either uh, on this program or any other, whether it's at the University of Leeds or anywhere else, we do have a, a guidance service that it's very easy to make an appointment for. So the this is a chance to chat to either Denise or Mohammed, one of our guidance workers who are both qualified and very experienced at Advisors. I think the students that you uh, heard from today both spoke to them, um, to one of them, and they can help you with figuring out whether university study might be for you, what qualifications you might need beforehand, um, uh, helping you with applications, figuring out whether part-time or full-time is going to work best for you, understanding what financial support you might get. So if you're interested in speaking to someone to just to help with that process, just give us a ring or email us. We'll send all this to you in the follow-up email with the recording of the session as well. Again, please do continue asking questions um, while I just take us through the, the final bits and pieces that we need to, to tell you before we wrap up. Um, so one thing that we'd like to do uh, before the session finishes is we're going to put a poll up on the screen just to get a little snapshot of whether you've found today's session useful and interesting so please do click on the 
category that most applies to what you think when you see that poll come up. Um, and then we will be sending a follow up email, as I say, which will have details of how to book a guidance appointment. It will have Nadine and Anita's email addresses if you want to chat to them at all or you have any further questions. Um, and you'll get the recording of the session and a link to our landing page where you can see details of all future tasters and general information online sessions that we're running. So the next one for learning and teaching is happening on the 23rd of June, I think it is, um, towards the end of the month. We've also got uh, sessions on student finance, on studying as a mature student, student, on all kinds of things that it might help you to figure out whether this might be for you at some point in the future. Um, and we'd like to you in we'd like to invite you in that follow-up email to our return to study Facebook page where you can interact with people like Gail and Helen and lots of other mature students ask them questions about their experience and find out more about what it's like to study as an adult um, so and the last thing that we will include in the um, follow-up email is a link to an evaluation form. Thank you very much for completing the poll. It's really good to see your responses. We'd like to keep our evaluation forms very, very short. It's a very quick online survey just to know what you thought of the session because as we've said, we're new to this way of working. We're trying to adapt and improve our practice all the time and we really do want to know how you found it. So I think that's all I need to say. Please do use the last minute or so to ask any questions if you have any. But most of all, we'd like to say thank you to all of you for participating in the session today and taking part. And thanks to Anita, Nadine and Gail and Helen as well. It's been fantastic to learn so much and to hear from both from all of you.